Hello and welcome. Can you all hear me okay? Because I'm not mic'd. So, okay. All right, welcome to the Knoxville Museum of Art. My name is Delena Feliciano, and I'm the Assistant Director of Education, and we are so happy to have you back. We had a great turnout. This is just our second Dine and Discover that we've been able to do in person in almost two years, so thank you so much for coming out. Uh, just a few reminders, uh, we are recording this, so try not to walk in front of the cameraman. And um, we would also appreciate if you could put your phones on silent or turn them off during the presentation to cut down on sound, okay? Um, I am happy to introduce our speaker for today, Mary Lauby. She is an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She teaches painting and drawing. Her MFA is from the University of Iowa, and her BFA is from Illinois State University. She has some fantastic exhibits that have displayed anywhere from New York City, Doha, St. Louis, and Nashville. She did an artisan residency at Yado, which some of you all may recognize from Buford Delaney doing artist in residency there as well. And she also has publications in several art magazines. And she is the co-founder of the Warp Whistle Project, a collaborative duo with composer Paul Schutt. Together they make work that merges kinetic stage sets with music and performance. So please welcome Mary Lauby. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Can you hear me okay? Good? Okay. Um, thank you again uh, for joining me today in celebration of this wonderful exhibition at uh, Global Asia's Contemporary Asian and Asian American Art. Uh, given the very special occasion that contextualizes my talk, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to not only talk about the inner workings of my paintings, but also how this connects to my identity as a li and, and also lived experiences as an Asian American. So while this is at, at its core an artist talk, I will also refer to and sometimes read the voices of others, writers, artists, theoreticians, anthropologists. I'm going to talk about my paintings and I'm also going to talk about Korean history, politics, post-colonialism, my family, and also how I came to the United States. The circulation of this exhibition is timely given the rise of racially motivated attacks against folks in the AAPI community. This exhibition upstairs challenges perspectives of Asia that perceive its continent and also its cultures as monolithic. Curator Chang Tan writes in the exhibition essay, Seeing Asia Anew, the works of art in global Asias are selected not for their default Asianness but for their varying ways of confronting and transforming the very concept of identity. Rear Crit Tiravanit, for example, in, uh, untitled The Map of the Land of Feeling, describes through a kind of diagrammatic drawing a deterritorialized map that is deeply personal and idiosyncratic, but also recognizable and accessible. The passport image, for example, is something, it's an object that we all likely have, However, it contains a multitude of meanings and implications based on each uni uh, individual unique person that holds one. Or Dean Q. Lay's Highway One, in different shades of, gr of gray, which deconstructs one of the most recognizable photographs from the Vietnam War and reweaves it into a slightly glitchy, almost quilt-like collage, a meditation on how the media produces an, a consumable iconography of suffering. In the work of these artists, identity is fluid. It's unbound by a reductive gaze, especially when understood in the context with each other. Each artwork tells a story, stories that reach well beyond the individual lives of each artist. History, politics, war, love, loss, these are universal themes that we may be able to draw between each work. 
However, the weight of this exhibition lies in its ability to simultaneously present the nuance and complexity of many voices. The stories that we share across disciplines, across identities, can contribute to cultural criticism in the field of art and beyond the field of art while producing a shared sense of true belonging. A colleague recently asked me if, he, if I thought of myself as a storyteller. Um, at first, I, I said I, I would not. Uh, I consider myself to be more of a listener or a reader of stories. However, after further consideration, I, I concluded that my paintings undoubtedly work as forms of and impetuses for storytelling. In January, I was invited to participate in artist Alex Paik's project, Correspondence Archive. Correspondence Archive is a platform in which he invites racialized artists to engage in dialogue through a written conversation between two people. Paik writes, these conversations will become a way to share and archive a diverse and nuanced range of ideas and individual practices from communities that have often been flattened or erased. In my conversation with ceramicist Dante K. Hayes, we discussed similarities between the formal conditions of his ceramic work and my paintings and how this relates to our individual relationships to diaspora. We talked about shadows, the color black, pattern, texture, uh, and also our, our relationship to the vessel. Dante, as a ceramicist, describes his work as upside-down vessels with hidden insides that are teeming with potential en energy. Similarly, I think of the objects in my paintings or even the paintings themselves as kinds of vessels, more broadly speaking, containers that store memory and also desire. In each example here up on the screen, the openings of these containers, of these vessels, are not visible, which I interpret as a kind of refusal. In a recent exhibition catalog of mine, writer Sarah Fritchie states, when we look at Laubi's work, we are not under the impression that we are able to fully know or consume the object on display. Its peculiar mysteries are abstracted. Her practice exercises what the poet, writer, and theoretician Edward Glissant termed the right to opacity, or the right to deny interpretive aid to individuals seeking full insight into the nuances of a minor culture that is not their own. Glissant designed this right as a defensive strategy that individuals could use to ward off advances from dominant cultures seeking to colonize, gentrify, and co-opt their traditions. So how can art recodify and resist colonial or monolithic perspectives on culture and identity? This is a question that very clearly circulates the exhibition upstairs, uh, but it's also a question that I have been pondering in my own studio over the last several years um, as it relates to my own experience as a Korean American. I was born in South Korea in 1985, and I came to the United States in 1987 through one of the largest waves of international adoption, which sent thousands of children abroad, mostly to the United States, close to 9,000 in a single year in 1985. Considering my placement in the United States as inseparable from a much longer history of global politics, my work explores the dynamics between my own individual identity, and also these broader collective formations of culture. Each of my works are prefaced by a careful study of museum artifacts, architecture, and also landmarks that are related to historic preservation in some way. Through reimagining my ob or objects, my paintings become artifacts themselves, artifacts of displacement, reunion, decolonization, memorial, and myth. My creative process involves paraphrasing and recontextualizing information belonging to the visual history of Korea into an abstract language that is distant, really quite distant from the original forms. So objects such as Buddha statues in this case, wrapping cloths, ink stones, and shaman symbols emerge in my work as synthesized forms that typically appear flattened, off-kilter, and most importantly, unnameable. 
Abstract painting works for me as a device for reshaping these seemingly embalmed fragments via the museum into a mutable idea. The Korean War erupted in 1950 following the country's historic division in 1945 between Soviet-influenced North Korea and U.S.-influenced South Korea. The conflict would have long-standing effects including economic damage, industrial collapse, and more than four million casualties. A lesser known effect of the Korean War was the establishment of a systematized industry of in international adoption. While adoption across borders during catastrophic times is very typical, Korean international adoption grew significantly and was criticized for its development well beyond the wartime era, where it peaked in the, peaked in the 1980s. Institutional behaviors, cultural norms, and long-held cultural norms contributed to both the overt coercion of women to relinquish children and the covert dismissal of unwed mothers as part of the massive post-war exportation of children. Many of these ideas have been concretized for me after coming across the scholarship of Orissa O oh on the Cold War origins of international adoption and also Alina J. Kim, who in her work on the politics of belonging and transnational adoption, she creates a framework um, for understanding the Korean adopted community as a counter public, a deterritorialized, as she says, social formation that emerged across many intersectional identities, including lab, class, religion, even language, for example. Many of us came to understand our Asian identity through bits and pieces and fragments, having been socialized often in white communities and therefore experiencing otherness in sometimes complete isolation. So these words, fragmentation, deterritorialization, de and difference can at the same time be applied to many of the formal and material conditions of my paintings. In fact, I am deeply interested in the pictorial logic of abstract painting in that it can hold onto seemingly contradictory ideas yet still remain whole. So for example, my work often uh, ha holds objects or forms that float between appearing illusionistic but also looking artificial. They appear flattened yet suggest an illusory space beyond the picture plane. Here's a detail so you can see some of the surface uh, textures of the work. They can read as spatial, but also physically retain this tactile and layered surface. Something that happens in my paintings is there are often these kind of surface deviations that are buried beneath the skin, kind of previous paintings that show through the outer layers. And what this deviation does is it interrupts the rationale of the actual image that I'm depicting in the final result of the painting. I'm using acrylic paint on rigid panels for its resili resiliency, I like to build layers up on the surface, but also sand back downward when necessary. And what this does is it articulates a kind of archeological way of building or finding an image in painting. I'm also interested in the power of light and shadows in the work, given the flat and shallow space that I typically de depict, the dark window on the left painting, for example, or that on the right, that kind of floating light triangle, they suggest that there's something happening off stage, behind the painting or even above its surface. And so the work often has physical shadow, real shadows that are cast by thick applications of paint, which you can probably see more closely in, in these detail images. And so those actual shadows are sometimes juxtaposed next to the illusion of shadow created from, the, uh, from gradations of color or even glazing. Compositionally, I'm interested in the borders or the periphery of my work um, as locations that gather tension. These are boundaries between the visible and the invisible, or there are demarcations between what we can see and also what we can imagine. Because of this compatibility of difference within painting, it, or painting, becomes not just an option or a convenience, but a necessity in representing the elusive and unrepresentability of particular diasporic identities. 
Before moving forward, um, I am going to jump backwards momentarily to provide some context. I grew up near the Chicago area in the northwest Chicago suburbs. Uh, my mom actually went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the 1970s and she studied fashion design. So in the 1970s, this is the Chicago Imagist painting era, um, and I think a lot about how my work intentionally but also unintentionally embraced this aesthetic history. So folks like Christina Ramber, Roger Brown, Ray Yoshida uh, had influences in my work through, throughout uh, my time learning how to paint. Um, and most, more specifically, I'm interested in the image's tendency to glean from a kind of surrealist image making that is rooted in collage. The Art Institute of Chicago is a museum that I grew up with. Some of my earliest memories of taking art classes uh, involved going into the wings of the museum and making drawings of the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings. And I wanted to include this painting, which is a painting from someone named Jeffrey Tamander. And this is a painting that I grew up with in my house. And my, it's, a, it's a work that my mom bought in the 70s from a student show at the Art Institute. And I think a lot of the imagery of this somehow kind of has seeped into the work without me even knowing it. Um, and this is a view of, it's, it's called the Museum Interior with Rodin Sculpture. And so you can see even on the side here this oblique view of the Monet Haystack painting. When I talk about my work and, and my earlier work, I often mention the Thorn Rooms, which is the image on the left, um, which are, if you're not familiar, are these shoebox-sized miniature rooms constructed uh, representing American and European interiors that date back as early as the 13th century, and they were made in the 1930s. I just wanted to bring it out, bring it up as a little shout out to the KMA. There are a few around, right around the corner you can go peek at if you want. Um, but they're really kind of these amazing uh, intricate constructions. Susan Stewart wrote a book in 1984 called On Longing. And in it she writes extensively about the miniature. She writes that the world of things can open itself to reveal a secret life indeed, to reveal a set of actions and hence a narrativity and history outside the given field of perception is a constant daydream that the miniature presents. This is the daydream of the microscope, the daydream of life inside life, of significance multiplied infinitely within significance. This passage has been one that's really important to me, not so much for it being about the miniature, but this is how I like to think about painting and what I imagine painting could really do. Um, and so it became a, a mantra, in a sense. Now I'm gonna show you something that I rarely show. This is a very old painting from 2008, and it's a rare sighting. Um, but I, again, I wanna show you all this to, to provide this kind of story, to talk about context. Um, this is what I consider to be a kind of origin painting to what I'm doing now, and that I can trace a lineage backwards to this. Um, this is an acrylic work, uh, it's acrylic and collage on MDF. It's a shaped panel. It's about three by four feet-ish. And it is from um, my undergraduate thesis exhibition that was called Walls and Windows. Uh, the title of that, Walls and Windows, was a very direct uh, description of some of the imagery I was using. So architectural spaces, interior, domestic spaces, textures, fabrics, patterns, um, things like that. Um, but I was also interested in the potential for walls and windows to become this metaphor that could represent what I was interested in painting. So the window, the historic uh, um, definition of what a painting is, a space in which we peer into. But also, a painting is just an object. It's, this, it's a flat surface, it's a wall that occupies the same space that we are in. Another significant thing about this work is that it's the first painting that I made um, after my mom died in 2008. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because um, it is very significant that in this early chapter of me figuring out what painting was to me was also a time that was grafted with a, with a very profound experience with mourning and with loss. 
And so from here on out, I started to kind of think about my work as being able to represent memory in some sense, and not in an anecdotal way. I was not wanting to paint stories of my memories, but to think about memory as a function of the brain that um, could be subjectively observed or philosophized about. Um, and so I turned to uh, somewhat you know, phenomenological definitions of what human experience is as an amalgamation of memory, of fantasy and desire, and also of an unfolding present experience. So jumping forward about eight years, um, this is a painting from 2016 um, and shows this kind of progression um, over the, that eight year period in which the work started to pull, you know, I'm, I'm painting and drawing from my everyday surroundings. So pulling information from uh, my home, the studios I've been working in, and maybe glimpses of places that I've traveled. But it's really about pulling the mundane and painting it in a way that's idealized or romanticized. Uh, the works are somewhat confrontational. They're kind of portrait-like. They're referencing and nodding to objects of memorial or objects of worship, such as totems, tombstones, altarpieces. At this point, the background of my paintings also start to become really flattened and ethereal, especially on the painting there on the left. I'm interested in the ability for, or for that background to be a, a a place to dislocate the viewer. And so the horizon line that you can see through the back is, can be read as either the meeting point of earth and sky, but is also maybe just the meeting point of a table and wall. So these questions about where am I, what am I looking at, these are the things that I'm kind of interested in unpacking some of the poetry of, um, in that when we ask these questions, many different answers can arrive. And so um, in the work, actually, I think I'm, gonna, I'm going too far ahead. Um, in, in this painting, we're, we're, or in these two works, we're seeing from 2016, 2012, rather, to 2016, um, this progression in which the work shifts from depicting spaces to depicting objects. And so I was interested in this kind of zooming in in which um, an object itself could reveal its own complex architecture and relationship to the viewer, very much the same way that a space can, or the depiction, the depiction of an interior space. Um, so here we can, if we return to Susan Stewart, this is where I'm imagining this kind of unfolding narrative of moving inward uh, to see a peeling back of additional layers. In the text, Death, Memory, and Material Culture, anthropologists Elizabeth Hallam and Jenny Hockey describe how historical metaphors for memory, metaphors um, typically in the West, often refer to objects of containment. They discuss how our interactions with material culture infuse our inanimate surroundings with meaning. And so while the objects that we collect, for example, are not considered living, they do carry a kind of autonomy uh, created by our socialization with them. Similarly, I like to think about my paintings as repositories that contain or even transpo uh, transport our ever-evolving experiences that are layered with memory, but also layered with romanticized projections. Within this context, I'm interested in interpreting my work, as I said, as, as portrait-like, in which the objects are ever so slightly anthropomorphic, haunted, mask-like, or even sentient. And so the work is very much about loss, about cultural loss, about personal loss, about memory loss. Um, but at the same time, I'm very excited about painting as this process that can um, investigate what emerges in those absences, right? So how can forgetting, how can forgetting be an opportunity for creative and generative thought? With generous support from a Sustainable Arts Foundation grant and also the University of Tennessee, I had the opportunity to travel to South Korea for six weeks to conduct visual research for new work in 2019. Uh, this was my first time returning to the country since I originally left in 1987. It also marks the beginning of, uh, the, or it, it was beginning a time in which I was kind of trying to fill 
redefine, reimagine the gigantic hole that was Korea for me personally. Um, while I was there, I had the opportunity to work with Korean objects and artifacts from various museums, memorials, and landmarks attempting to preserve Korea's historic past. I visited numerous sites throughout Seoul, but also beyond Seoul, including the National Museum of Korea, the War Memorial of Korea, the tombs of the Joseon Dynasty, and numerous folk villages, uh, temples, and also art museums. Most of my research was centered at the National Museum of Korea, and here I was working with objects and artifacts in their collection very closely through private viewings in a scholar's program. And so when I set out to do this, my focus began with things that I thought I wanted to paint, things such as uh, objects related to adornment, textiles, jewelry, things that are worn, um, but also memorialization objects related to funerary or burial practices. However, in the end, uh, my observations really spanned an array of objects um, and, and spanned thousands of years of history. And this is uh, one of uh, the museum's most famous objects, which is a screen painting depicting scholars' equipment. I'm really excited about these kind of miniature paintings within the larger screen because each object seems to kind of have its own internal logic of light and shadow, but doesn't really affect anything in the environment. And so there's this kind of separation between the figure and the ground that I think is really uncanny um, and really interesting. And so through uh, drawing, photography, and actually a lot of written notes, which I didn't expect to do, I compiled this reservoir of information for the development of future paintings. These are a few examples of the sketchbook pages that I produced while I was in Korea. I was working largely from a very small apartment um, in the middle of Seoul, but also various coffee shops and parks um, in lieu of a studio. And so my time with the objects and the private viewings was really unique and surprising in that I could interact with them outside of that typical museum context. So without the glass, without the labels and the crowds. And the intimacy of this experience allowed me to meditate on the objects, not just as props that tell a national story, but objects that were meant to be held and meant to be socialized with. So in the next several slides, I'm going to share with you a few of the paintings that came out of this research and also do some <coughs> revealing of where, these, where the objects came from that they're referencing. Um, which I typically only do uh, at a lecture such as this. Um, and my hope is not to demystify the work in, in any way, but rather open them up ever so slightly to reveal my process. This painting, um, called Goddess of Birth, uh, is inspired by ritual objects that are employed by Korean shamans. This specific form on the right resembles a hat that represents a fertility goddess called Samshin Halmoni. And uh, Samshin Halmoni is a triple goddess of childbirth in Korean indigenous mythology. This is a painting of a headrest. Headrests are rigid objects that are actually used all over the world. Um, and they are considered to be precursors to the soft pillows that we sleep on today. And depending on where they were used and when they were used, they perform many, many different functions. Um, I'm specifically, I was excited about uh, the headrest that has a kind of mystical characteristic as a death object that's used to communicate with the afterlife. This piece is called bojagi, and bojagi refers to a small quilt-like textile that are often made from cloth remnants, and so it looks very much like a quilt. Um, these are used as wrapping claws. They're quite small. They're used to wrap objects such as food or gifts and are employed in daily life and were traditionally used in daily life. Um, when you do come across these in a museum, though, they are displayed on a flat wall, just very much like an abstract painting. However, um, when you can imagine them being employed on a day-to-day -day basis, it is actually a vessel that takes on many different shapes depending on the shape of its contents. And this is one of um, my, my early, early attempts of integrating Korean imagery into my work. And this actually predates my, pro, uh, my research trip to Korea. Um, and it is based on my own memories of wearing traditional Korean clothing or hanbok when, um, as a child. 
In October um, 2021, I had uh, an opportunity to have a solo exhibition at Ortega y Gasset Projects in Brooklyn, New York. The show was curated by Eric Hibbett and was also accompanied by a beautiful catalog and an essay by writer Sarah Fitchie, whom I read from earlier. Um, working with um, various objects through this kind of studying in the museum um, had me kind of thinking about um, the time frame that I was engaging with. Um, some of these objects were considered ancient. Um, and so it made me think about this ritual of painting them as a kind of conversation with my ancestors, a way to connect uh, over time. And so I began in putting the show together, experimenting with metaphors uh, that came from Korean shamanism, citing concepts from shamanic mythology to serve as titles for the paintings, but also the show title, Songs for the Sun and Moon. And the work included in this show uh, came from this period of 2018 to 2021, and half of the paintings were made specifically for this show. Um, Songs for the Sun and Moon was also conceived of as an homage to the, my parents that raised me. While the undertones of some of my research is really deeply critical, um, this exhibition was intended to honor them and also to highlight and kind of celebrate the very loving and pretty radical ways that they expanded uh, the normative definition of what an American family looks like. Hence the title, Songs for the Sun and Moon thinking of my parents. And these two paintings are based on Korean kite designs. And really, in the installation image shows, they, they kind of acted as a focal point. As you walk in, they're at the very back. So I have been having some conversations with friends and colleagues here at UT about a word. The word is sentimental. Um, sentimental as something that's pejorative. And it's, used, it's a word that's often used in art school or in the art world uh, to dismiss certain work for um, being emotional, um, as if this quality is somehow understood only in opposition to the intellectual. I have spent many years trying to wrestle my work away from revealing too much. Even putting this lecture together today was pretty difficult for me because of this simultaneous pressure to be truthful, but not too intimate, not too sad, um, not too critical. However, the truth is, is that the work that I have been submerged in and the research that I've been submerged in culturally, but also personally over the last several years um, has been just that, deeply critical of the global narratives that separated me from Korea. It's painful, it feels tragic at times, However, reflecting on my personal migration story as it relates to broader expressions of culture reminds me that the personal is political and the stories that are sustained through memorialization are not only vestiges of the past, but reservoirs that can reflect the present and also reimagine and imagine the future in very critical and pressing ways. The collection of artworks that are upstairs in the Global Asia's exhibition does not aim to represent or define, other than to say that identity itself is non-fixed, it's temporal, and in a sustained state of redefinition. The refusal to tick a box or satisfy a category is a powerful mode of resistance, and in this sense, art is a form of storytelling capable of enacting significant change. For this reason, I'm deeply, deeply grateful for the curator, Chang Tan, and everyone else who's been involved in bringing this exhibition to Tennessee. It was such a pleasure to speak with you all today about my work, um, and thank you for your time and attention. I would love to turn this into a conversation if anyone has questions, um, but again, thank you. So I think it became um, a necessity because it has that kind of resiliency to work almost sculpturally. Um, and that, for me, connects to the fragmentation of collage. 
you know, this idea of juxtaposing, recontextualizing, redefining, I think metaphorically is, is something that I stumbled upon. I didn't intend for it to be that way. Um, but it is the way that I, I like to, to represent things in the, in the work is through that collage aesthetic. Is it much easier to express your beliefs in your work in the crow? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say so, yeah. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And did you I just wonder how long you've been at UT. Yeah. Oh, this is my fifth year at UT. And I, have to, I did do one year at, at UTC in Chattanooga. masking and so there's a lot of taping I'm making stencils which is why the acrylic is really great for that process um, and then you know there is a bit of, of hand paint you know I like to soften things at times um, but each each painting each pattern each kind of little citation that I, I approach in the studio has its own set of problems and so that maybe that's a mask maybe that's a little bit of combination of both but it's like every, every new thing has a, it's a new set of problems and um, definitely dictates the way that it's made. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, a lot of this work, um, I mean, so these two paintings are 20 by 16, 24 by 18. Um, and are a bit larger than what I usually work, work in. I had been making work that was just about 12 by 12 inches, you know, pretty small. I um, mean, I think that that naturally came from my interest in the miniature. Like, I was looking at dollhouses and small spaces that, you know, trying to imagine how these could actually become quite large. Um, I don't know if that's as much of a necessity anymore. I am starting to play with some larger pieces. Um, yeah. I had, an, I had another thought about scale, but I think that's it. I think the size of your studio sometimes determines the size. That's true, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm so interested to hear that you have a dialogue going uh, among colleagues at UT mm -hmm. about, I'm, I'm thinking the word nostalgia. Yes. You were talking mm -hmm. about various versions of that. Mm -hmm. Do you, what are the what are the the questions? What questions are you asking yourselves? Are they like how to sh how to share your own nostalgia with other people? Mm. How to do it visually? Um, you know, I'm always trying to figure out what the main question. Is. Sure. Well, for 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 my, my the question that I'm specifically asking is more of a response to a kind of criticality, um, in which work in certain spheres, in academia, maybe in the art world, in which um, work that is considered nostalgic or sentimental is dismissed, right, right? is not considered intellectual or you know, elitist kind of art. Right. And so I've been talking with some of my colleagues about that specific criticism, um, because I think my work is, can be sentimental, and the way that I, write, I, I talk about it is also deeply personal, and so, um, the question is about redefining and re-looking at that word, not as something that's negative, but is actually a, a very much ingrained in, into the intellectual and in, into the kind of this like progress forward of thinking. Um, you know, and I could talk more about that too because I think that word is also really gendered. I think it's, um, it, I think I think it's a covert way to dismiss you know associations with um, female. Huh women, you know, women artists. And so, but, you know, that's a bigger conversation. And also muddy. You know, I think one part of me talking with my colleagues is that I don't, I don't have the answers, but that's, you know, we have a really great um, community, and so we can kind of work through some of these ideas together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, hi. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here mm -hmm. as an Asian American woman. It's always a pretty rare treat to hear another Asian American woman talking really frankly and taking herself very seriously. Yeah. Um, and then second, I um, love what 
what you said about some of the work um, that you showed earlier as being very opaque and not, um, not necessarily letting in the viewer to see what's inside. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really intriguing. And then that made me think about um, artists and then access to their work in general mm -hmm. um, because I'm a docent at this museum. Mm -hmm. And so to me, access to art is a really interesting question. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the responsibility of the artist to figure out how audiences should access their work. I was wondering if you had any Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think, um, yeah, so the conversation about opacity is definitely linked to this. Um, in that it's, it's like, it, there's a right, the idea is that there's a right to opacity, that it is a kind of like how much one reveals is entirely kind of idiosyncratic to the artist. Uh, in terms of how the meaning is generated beyond me, I, I, I fully believe that, in fact, there's a class that my colleague Rubens and I are co-teaching right now, and we're talking about um, a text written by Alan D'Souza in which he um, talks about what is art and how, how do we define it. And he defines, he, he includes within that equation audience and viewership, and that meaning is going to be generated outside of our control. And in fact, that's something that makes it really beautiful and really transformative and, uh, you know, and, um, gives it power to, to change the world and to change culture and um, kind of, you know, collective imaginations. And so, um, yeah, I don't try, I, I actually don't do very much thinking, I don't, I don't try to dictate or think about how others will interpret the work. And that's not to be selfish, but that's actually to, to give people the autonomy to read it because they're their own subjective person and I can't control their feeling, then nor should I, right? Because oftentimes we share art with each other because we learn more about the work through dialogue, through community, because um, we're not isolated, you know, and we shouldn't be. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's, that's a really good question and something I actually talk about quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Over here. reasons why I wanted to like go far back, like as far back as I will let you all into my, into my history as a painter, which is 2008 maybe. But um, yeah, I think that that's, um, that's a really good question and, and something that is, um, that, that is important. I think within, if you can think about the talk spanning that time period, it took that time period for me to even put together these ideas. You know, uh, what's great about a lecture is that it's a time to sit down and write and put some of these connections together because writing itself is a creative process. Um, I would say usually I don't, this is not preconceived, like predetermined. You know, maybe I was like liked miniatures and I went to the Thorn Rooms and I went to Chicago so I liked the images. You know, those kinds of things, but thinking about how they connect and weave to my family history, you know, and all of that is, you know, I mean, it's done after the fact, but I think that there is a wisdom in it as I'm, as I'm making the work that maybe I'm not cognizant of. At least that's what I tell myself. You know, that there, there is something truthful in there. Um, and you just have to kind of reveal it in some ways. I don't know, let's come back to me on that, on that last thing I just said. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. And I did, you know, I didn't talk too extensively about these works, but these were my um, <laughs> pandemic drawings. <laughs> this is like what got me through the pandemic was, I, you know, I moved back, I was, I have two small children too in an open concept house. And so 
I didn't really have a studio space. I was at a small table, and these drawings were kind of the only thing that I could do. But they did, they did keep me going, because I was making these very much in the same way that I was thinking of the paintings. Um, I think that coming and being, you know, isolated in that way actually made me, it like increased my sense of urgency to go back to Korea and to continue this work. Um, even after about a year's time of working with these references, um, I'm starting to feel that distance happen again. Um, the, ob the paintings that came from that private viewing, the observation where I'm in a couple hours working with something, those paintings are just different, you know, and they have, there's something about them that I cannot recreate through a kind of digital archive that I have been working from um, since. And so um, I think if anything, it's, it's, it's um, kind of spearheading a, a plan to, um, to find ways to return regularly. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. I don't need to get back up there, but I just want to thank everyone for coming today and let you know please visit the exhibition Global Asia's Contemporary Asian and Asian American Art from the Jordan D. Schnitzer and his Family Foundation collection. And it is open through April 24th. And we also, the recording will be available on the KMA YouTube channel um, in a couple weeks, but also thanks to um, Knox, Media, Knox Community Media, um, it will be on some of the local channels as well, and we will post that on our Facebook. Okay? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.